At independence in 1960, the huge human and natural resources across the regions that made up Nigeria stood out as strength for an evolving country. But these were soon to be tested in what many now refer to as one of the bloodiest civil wars in history. January 15, 1966 comes a twist that upset the peace in the Nigerian military cycle, with some young officers led by Major Chukuma Kaduna Nzogu, an Igbo officer from present-day Okmanam in Delta State, staging a coup d'etat against the then-civilian government, killing dozens of people, including the Prime Minister of Nigeria, Tafawa Balewa, many senior politicians, senior army officers, many of them from the north. The officer give reasons for the coup to include massive corruption and abuse of office. General Johnson Aguyi Ironsi, who was the most ranking military officer then assumes office. July 1966, a counter coup which cut short the regime of General Ironsi and then the emergence of Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan. Earlier, during the riot of May 1966, thousands of Easterners, mostly Igbos, were killed in many northern cities, especially in Kaduna, Kanu and Jaws. The coming of Gowan to power did not stop the systematic killings such was the horror that attended Gowan's early days in office. By the end of 1966, thousands of refugees who were pouring into the East returned with tales of horror. A decision was then taken that soldiers and civilians should return to their region of origin. At a summit in Benin, the permanent secretaries presented a paper to Gowan that all the four regional military governors be replaced and new regions created to form 12 states in the federating units. Although Ojuku was absent at the meeting, he rejected the outcome and declared the Republic of Biafra. The war just didn't start, start like that. There were stages, things were happening, and then there were a number of conferences trying to stop it. But uh, instead of getting better, it was getting worse. And uh, there was preparation for war on both sides. We all knew this. And when it broke out, um, Actually, just before it broke out, Ojuku, who was the uh, leader on the Biafran side, decided to release those of us who were in prison, who were in detention by uh, Iran's government. And we were on the eastern side of the country at the time. So this was the area of jurisdiction of Lieutenant Colonel Ujuku. Of course he knew he wasn't doing it just to favor us. He knew that we would be useful to him in the war. Other unresolved issues were the ethno-religious riots in northern Nigeria, alleged persecution of Igbos living in northern Nigeria and control of the oil-rich Niger Delta. To settle a growing national instability, Political negotiations, including the famous Aburi Accord, were initiated, but none could assuage the thirst of the Easterners for our secession. Various political attempts were made to, to solve the problem, going even to Aburi uh, in a meeting, the disagreement there, which really you know, came about the interpretation what Aburi uh, Ina meant and uh, from Ojuku he says 
on Aburi we stand. And I say, from Aburi you will fall. Lieutenant Colonel Chukwe Meka Ojuku declares the Republic of Biafra. And this was resisted by the federal government, resulting in the war from 1967 to 1970. There was a pogrom, mass starvation, leading to death of over 2 million civilians, including women and children. The civil war, unfortunately, you know, had to happen as a result of breakdown of that Aburi uh, in agreement, uh, despite effort that was made you know, to, uh, to see if we can reconcile our differences and really save a, a very uh, serious situation. But uh, it got to the stage whereby Ojuku you know, got his uh, in, uh, constituent assembly uh, to give him the go ahead uh, to uh, break away from uh, Nigeria. While the Nigerian military had all the firepower to execute the war, the Biafran soldiers largely depended on the ingenuity of its people, who went into research and production of war equipment. Selected to be one of those to join the research production. Uh, somebody, uh, uh, Professor Pius Okeke, was in physics. He's he not on, uh, as a he on, as a nuclear physicist. When he, he's a professor, he retired. He was selected also, and then one professor there is a, is an energy specialist. Three of us were all who I remember who were selected to work research and production as students. So. Most of us, I was there. I was part of the team that produced all the bombs, all the rockets, all those equipments. There was another team that was producing armored vehicles. So they are producing armored vehicles. They, are pro they were using, we use a, a you know, caterpillar. You know, this uh, tractor, this is a caterpillar that run on wheel to produce armored vehicles. So they produce, Biafra produced his, all these equipments. And then we were able to sustain the war for that uh, period of time. The Eva Valley headquarters of research and production, also known as PRODA, had the best hands, some of whom came from the University of Nigeria, Nsuka. 78-year-old Emeka Onyiso, who witnessed the war, shared slides on how they operated. It will surprise you what they were able to accomplish. One of the most outstanding accomplishments was the, what, what was branded Obunigwe. I'm sure you must have heard about it, and uh, various other things. Ubrigo is a cone-shaped, sometimes cylindrical cluster bomb that dispasses shrapnel with percussion. It was, they even went as far as not only making these bombs, but providing guidance for quite some distance. And that's not a joke. That's not a joke within the short time they had to make them and use them. We had no option other to, than to res, refine crude petroleum for movement. Movement in, in Saudi Africa was maintained because our people were able to refine petrol into gas and, uh, and petrol and the rest of it. The major operational base, the famous Ojuku Banker and the Voice of Biafra, now houses the National War Museum, where housing some of the relics of the civil war, including the very famous Obunigwe. In the administration, you have the armored cars. Then, uh, at the uh, annex is the Obunigwe. The mass killer, two, two of them flying Obunigwe and, and in, in his sitting place. Now, these armored cars, majority of them were manufactured by the defunct Biafra. Then, some of them are, were captured by the Nigerians or by the Biafran during the, the war course, even including the, the one they captured at Uguta, they call Uguta boy, and even the one, the, the gunboat they sunk at uh, Uguta Lake, which is still there. 
we made a platform to exhibit it until it is brought. So all these ones, we are war relics. And I, I want to point out that recently the army came and also helped us to maintain it. Though the museum now wears a toga commemorating a peaceful and unified Nigeria, our tour shows the magnitude of effort put in by the Biafrans towards self-actualization. The Biafran army also built an airstrip in Uli in Anambra state, where fighter jets took off and landed. Today, urban renewal and development has kicked in with numerous houses encroaching. But there are now calls for it to be added on the list of national monuments. When we lost Enugu Airport, of course we had to refer to Uli. We started using it. And because the Nigerian Air Force had superiority over Biafra, that time we didn't have even, uh, we didn't have any aircraft. So they could come in broad daylight, start strafing or bombing or doing anything they liked. What we had to do was use our machine guns and you know that's no answer. Then we started the acquiring aircraft, the one we call Mini Coin. They will take off, come to the sneak to the uh, target shoot them and they are gone. The history, uh, to my mind, uh, and to any good Iberman, served wonderful purpose for the Biafran survival. Uh, the airstrip served as a place through which relief came into this place. Despite the fact that uh, they were pursued, uh, the place were pursued by the federal troops, uh, the Biafran intelligence unit had to construct uh, what they call a bunker, the first time in the history of the world, where they had a bunker so that once the plane lands, it you know, rolls into a bunker, so that the uh, over, overriding of over, an intruding plane does not catch it. One of the sore points of the Biafra Civil War is the Asaba Massacre of October 1967. It remains a sad commentary to the nation, and many who witnessed the incident believe the nation must not go through a similar path. Chief Philip Asiodu is an elder stateman, Professor Patutomi, a political economist, and Boniface Chizia is an economist, all of them indigenous of present-day Delta states. When, we you know, the, as should be expected, the reference then, impact on asymmetric warfare, so, you know, guerrilla warfare, you know, hit and run. So they come in the night, they will hit Nigerian uh, soldiers, you know, kill some of them and disappear. Out of that anger and fury that they've killed them, they'll be looking for any man, any man that's in sight uh, was targeted. And many, many Asaba men, able-bodied men, were killed. I remember vividly on two occasions I had gone to school. I went to school to teach and got stuck in the school and got stuck in the school for, for quite some time, you know, because it wasn't safe to leave the school and go back home. One night, I crossed the Niger in a canoe from what was the Biafran side onto a war theater on the other side, what was the Midwest. Uh, and when I crossed, we had had this horrible incident in Asaba where there had been a massacre of people who had come out to demonstrate, to wave, to welcome the Federal troops that were approaching Asaba, and men were lined up this way, women this way, and cold-blooded slaughter of thousands of people, literally. And, and so here I was coming to Asaba with a group of friends, family, were trying to cross from one part of the road to the other from the bush, the jungle, uh, as it were, and crossing the, the road that led from Asaba through Ibuza or Washi down, and we were, quote-unquote, captured. Hmm. And we were lined up. Men this way, women this way, and some, some fellow was saying to us, where are the rest of the rebels? Where are the rest of the rebels?
The war ends in 1970 with General Gowon declaring no victor, no vanquished. And instituted what he termed the three arms rehabilitation, reconstruction, and reconciliation. Hello, Your Excellency. Glad to see you again. My pleasure. How are you? Very well, indeed. Glad to see you again. I, Major General Philip Ethiam, officer administering the government of the Republic of Biafra, now wish to make the following declaration that we affirm we are loyal Nigerian citizens and accept the authority of the federal military government of Nigeria. Materials were given to enable people uh, build back their shacks. But quite interestingly, in places like Lagos, even the people who had properties and gone away, Rents were collected, kept intact. When they came back, they were given by the way uncle and others. It's only in Port Harcourt, unfortunately, that they did these abandoned properties and took over people's properties. And you know, the Igbos had developed much of Port Harcourt. That was very, very unfortunate. And he must praise the Igbo man for his courage and resilience in no time at all. Despite the pogroms and all that, they were back in many, they were back in many of these cities. However, this gesture of no victor, no vanquish was not well executed. For me, the civil war never ended. At the end of that war, my father, oh no, it never ended. It's still going on. I had no family house. My poor mother went back to claim the property she was beating into a coma by people whom she had helped all her life and sent to school because she's an evil woman and now Port Harcourt belonged to another group of people. They forgot the sacrifices that the evils made. It's still going on. No apology has ever been made about that. Unfortunately, after the change of government, with the program that the family we have, uh, which was going to allow them uh, to be able to be uh, equal in all respect, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, yes, uh, those that came probably d d did not have the belief and the philosophy that uh, you know we we have that my government have in order to in, uh, ensure fairness to every uh, part, part of na 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 Nigeria. The unity we saw it from fighting to remain united. We didn't do much in trying to get people to indoctrinate them through political interactions and the rest of them. So the moment you reintroduce politics, the first thing that came to our minds were what political parties and political system used to be before the civil war. Uh, you saw that as a starting point. And once you see that, you could hardly change it. Some of the combatants and commentators believe that not much has been done in the reconciliation and reintegration process. How can I forget the past in this condition? Hunger is a disease. I have no food to eat. I will always tell my children this story for the sake of posterity. Yes. They promised to pay us some compensation. They even asked us to register for it, but nothing has happened since then. They call for a robust political inclusion and infrastructure development in the Southeast, amongst others. It's now 50 years after the war, 
and the reason for the war are still with us. All we are saying is that those issues that made our fathers go for war should be addressed. When there is true reconciliation, all these remnants of ventilation of anger and people venting their anger from this old downs. Five zones have benefited to serve within this country uh, in the office of the president. The only way to establish that there is no victor, no vanquish is simple. A southeasterner that will do what the president of Nigeria by 2023. The people from Biafra, people from the southern region of Nigeria have been calling for a roundtable discussion so that we can renegotiate in Nigeria, we can discuss about our future as a people. Like I said earlier, we believe in Nigeria. Here in, in, in every part of Nigeria you will see Biafrans, the Igbo people are there, believing that we are one. So how best can healing and national reconciliation be achieved? The challenges we have in this country, apart from the cost of election and what have you, stems from the fact that people stay too long in power and people do everything to remain in power. Let us do one term. Within that one term, you can go to south, 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 east, southwest, north, central, this, that, that, and we start all over again. Six times six, 36 years. In 36 years, it's gone around all the ge geopolitical zones and we start again. By the time we do that, by the time we do that, some other people would have gotten sense of belonging. They would have gotten sense of belonging. The Igbos would have been given the opportunity to test power and then let them now decide whether they want to misuse power and forget about it forever amongst other things. But give them that opportunity. In 1991, after the return to democracy, Chief Raf Uwazirike founded the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra, Masob, a group canvassing for the secession and sovereignty of eastern Nigeria. Another group, the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP, with similar objective, was founded by Umnam De Kanu in 2012. He and his supporters resurfaced the agitation for the sovereign state of Biafra using an underground radio station called Radio Biafra to propagate their ideas. There were also protests, sometimes leading to confrontation with security agencies. In one of the face off the group had with security agencies in his father's house in Oka, Anambra State, some persons sustained injuries, but government came out strong to deny the allegations, claiming that the group constantly violated the constitution. Eventually, the group was declared a terrorist group and then proscribed. The group has not stopped its agitation, as they now operate more using social media. For him. At the recent Never Again conference, some key suggestions on how to forge closer unity among ethnic nationalities in Nigeria were muted. Many believe that there is need to address the issue of fairness and proper integration of the people from the Southeast. Nigerians have to reflect on the road we have passed. For example, the proposition can be made that we went to war because there was a failure of leadership. And in saying that, I will remind us that the three regions were really doing very well. The critical question is why does Nigeria wobble so badly in spite of experience that should be driving it forward and what can be done about it? I think we can list reasons to include one. A mistaken view that Nigeria is about how much you can extract from the national cake. A cake to eat makes poor tomorrow, but producing makes rich always. There is a duty that each and every one of us has. It is a duty to believe that it can be different and that if we can dream it, we can make it happen. We are already in a crisis. If we 
in our sober deference to reality find that we can no longer hold together as one country, then let us together peacefully find a rational solution. And let us never again plunge into any kind of war among us. The leadership on whichever side is about to repeat yet again the ultimate folly of sacrificing two and a half million lives on the altar of absolutes any absolute whatsoever we should borrow that african american credo paint them on prayer scrolls flood the skies in their millions with kites bearing that inscription and balloons that read very simply african lives matter another issue raised is the need for the present leadership to consider merits and appointments as a way of national reconciliation by now, there is no ethnic group. There is no group in Nigeria that does not have very qualified persons. We should go back to merit. We should go back to merit in addressing issues. The idea of uh, a geographical disadvantage, and it doesn't fly anymore. The entity called Biafra no longer exists as Nigeria has once again become a one united country. But the lessons from this war must always guide the leaders and the citizens of the country in the act of governance, loyalty and commitment towards upholding the vision of the founding fathers. No part of this country must feel deprived enough that it will have to resort to war. And one way to start is perhaps the issue of constitution review adoption on merits and appointment, and the issue of Igbo presidency. These may just be a few reasons for the Igbos to feel a sense of belonging.